Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me again. Um, I just kind of wanted to start out by asking how many people here are using hybrid IMRT for their breast plans? Okay, so some of you, not too many. It's something that I think has become a little bit more popular in recent years. I'll go through a little bit of the research as we go through about the benefits of hybrid IMRT plan. As I'm sure you guys know, with all IMRT plans that we do, the issue that we often have is IMRT approval from insurance companies. So what we've been working on at University of Maryland is not only determining when we can do hybrid IMRT planning, but when we don't have the option for IMRT, what our other options are and how comparable those are. So that's what I'm going to go through today. Um, my outline is an overview, a little bit of the past research on 3D versus hybrid IMRT plans, and then kind of taking you through a description of the breast cases. I think um, it's important to see how other people do things, give you an idea of what we look at and why we make the decisions that we do. At the University of Maryland, we've come up with some practice guidelines over the past year for every treatment site that we do. We've come up with DVH criteria. The physicians have their criteria of when to treat and how to treat, and what we look at when we do the plannings. We've also come up with some specific dosimetry tips. So the purpose of this talk today is to give you a little bit of information about what we do, how we do it, and the best way that we found to do it so far. Um, we're also looking to turn this into a little bit of a bigger project, which I'll go through a little bit later. So I'm going to take you through simulation, treatment planning, um, look at some 3D uh, forward planning and control point plans versus hybrid IMRT versus wedge plans, and then we'll get to some conclusions about the plans that I'm going to show you. So as everybody I'm sure knows, concerns with standard 3D uh, tangent breast plans, you get a lot of hot spots, dosing homogeneity can lead to poor cosmetic outcomes, especially in women with larger breasts or larger separations, or especially in our patients who might be chest walls. Um, those aren't our sim simple tangent plans, but we see a lot of problems with the uh, shape of those breasts and the chest walls. So there's been a lot of papers on this. I'm sure all of you have probably seen a few of them. The, one of the most recent was 2008. They looked at skin reactions and desquamation in patients, and they also looked at the five-year outcomes of these patients and found that there is often a lot of pain, reduced quality of life, fibrosis, um, not the breast appearance, appearance is not what the women would hope at five years. So we're now trying different things like hybrid IMRT to reduce the hotspots and hopefully increase the quality of life in these patients, not only during treatment, but a few years later. One of the other major concerns is the use of hard wedges and how that can increase scatter to the contralateral breast, increasing, increasing the risk of radiation malignancies. And obviously, we're concerned about our critical structures, the heart in our left-sided breast patients and the lung. So some of the background about hybrid IMRT, it's been around for a while, though I think it's gotten a lot more popular in recent years. In 2000, a study was done comparing 3D wedge plans with hybrid IMRT. It found that overall, the IMRT plans had lower areas of hotspots and lower maximum doses than um, the 3D wedge plans. In 2002, a study looked at static MLC IMRT, which showed increased homogeneity, but it didn't directly compare anything, any of those plans to um, their own 3D plans. They were comparing to other research that had been done in the past. A study in 2006 compared the contralateral breast dose in 3D wedge plans and hybrid IMRT plans. Not surprisingly, found that there's lower contralateral breast dose with IMRT because we're more able to control that. We don't have to scatter with the wedge. And in 2008, um, a study compared wedge plans versus IMRT to look at acute radiation dermatitis and found less reactions in IMRT plans, presumably due to the lower hotspots and better homogeneity. The concern that I had with some of this research is there's a lack of publication about the comparison of 3D plans with wedges versus 3D plans with forward planning or control points and hybrid IMRT. So while we've compared wedges to hybrid IMRT and hybrid IMRT overall, I'm not sure there's a great comparison between all three types of plans, and that's hopefully what we're, I'm going to show you a little bit, bit about today. Um, the problem with all these studies is how do you actually decide if a plan is a good enough plan to treat? We can say that 95% needs to cover with 95% of the dose, but really it ends up becoming a physician's call. If it's a tumor that they think needs a little bit more coverage based on the margins that they got, the numbers don't necessarily mean anything. It's going to be a clinical call. The location of the hotspots is also very important for our physicians. Um, as I'll show you later, they don't like any hotspots in the inframammary fold. So while an IMRT plan might have lower 105% hotspot overall, if that hotspot's in the fold, they won't accept that plan. So I'm going to take you through some of that, um, kind of come up with the idea that we don't yet have a way to determine, is there a way to determine with numbers whether a plan's better or not? 
So to take you through a little bit what we do with our breast treatment plan. So what do we consider early stage versus late stage? Obviously, tangents alone versus a four field plan of tangents and superclav, whether or not we're treating the IM nodes. I know a lot of places don't necessarily treat the IM nodes. We do with our late stage patients, most of our physicians at least. The fraction size and the dose, 1.8 to 2 gray. We've also started more commonly using Canadian fractionation of 2.66 gray a day. And then our boost volume. Um, Again, I'm going to be talking about tangent plans here, so we're not going to get into the four field. I also want to note that um, this is comparing all patients supine. We are starting to use prone. One of my colleagues actually did a presentation at our regional meeting about prone patients, but I won't be comparing that in here, so that's something else we might need to consider in the future. Also, PBI is being used more commonly, so again, something else to think about as we compare how we do breast planning. So what do we contour? Obviously, we're going to contour the ipsilateral lung. We contour our heart for our left-sided breasts. We always contour out the scar wire just so that our physicians can see that and make sure that the cavity that they're drawing matches where the surgeon has been. When we have the scar wire on there, we always density override that to air because obviously we're not going to have that during treatment. We also create a breast PTV volume so that we can better evaluate what we're treating and making sure that we cover what we want to treat. So this just kind of shows you what our volumes end up looking like. The red here is our seroma cavity. Um, this I'll show you later is a flash contour that we create. It's a little bit hard to see, but the green is our breast PTV um, structure. So our simulation procedure. I know we go over simulation every time you hear one of these presentations. It probably gets a little bit old, but I don't think it's, I think it's always important just to remember and be reminded how important it is to have a process that you're used to, that everybody's comfortable with, and that's reproducible on a daily basis. So as I said, um, we're currently treating most of our patients supine. We're moving towards prone, but this presentation will focus on supine. We um, use a breast board, wing board. We angle the breast board based on the angle of the chest wall to minimize lung dose, have the arms up, the head turned towards the contralateral breast to try and make sure their chin's out of any field in case it's going to be a higher, a higher tangent field. We put a backlock bag under the arms for patient comfort. As I said, we wire over the scar. Some of our physicians put wire borders for the breast tissue, a soup and an inforder, as well as a medial and a lateral. Some contour, put a wire contour, contour all the way around the breast just so that when we're planning we know exactly what we need to treat. It's especially hard to tell on a CT scan sometimes in the larger breasted women. So we have that there for them to use. And again, just remember to density override those if you feel it's necessary um, that your field's going through that. We also put in a knee sponge. I'm going to show you a picture in just a minute of what our setup looks like. And just remember that the patient has to be comfortable. They're going to be doing this every day for 25, 33 treatments, however you end up, whatever you end up doing at your site. Um, but you really need them to be able to hold up their arm for that long, and that's usually our biggest issue. They're okay during the sim. They think, it's fine, I can push through this. But once you get in a few days of radiation treatment, they start to feel the effects of the radiation, and their arm that was already sore from their surgery is a little bit worse, and they can't hold their arm up. You might end up re-simming. So from the beginning, try and make it something that works for your setup, is going to work for your tangent fields, but also is reproducible on a daily basis. We're using a big bore CT with three millimeter slice thickness. We scan about five centimeters above the supraclav and five centimeters below the breast tissue just so that we can ensure we're getting what we need to treat. And just a reminder is that constant interaction with the therapist is important. So we're constantly going back and forth. If we find something that we think could have been done a little bit better, or if they have a question about a way, an angle that they're doing, or if an arm position is going to work, we're really good about working together, and they'll call us into the sim, or we'll show them afterwards. And we've come up with some really good plans because we're able to interact. So always keep those lines of communication open. Keep it open with your physician. If your physician goes into the sim, have them be looking out for certain things too because it's really helpful and it saves everybody a lot of time in the end. So this is our setup for one of our breast patients. Um, you can see pretty much everything I've talked about. The uh, foam pillow under the legs, we have the back lock, arms up. We can, it obviously helps us with the arm position. You can see the angle on the breast board here. It's a little bit hard to see, but we have the superior, inferior, and lateral borders as well as a wire around her breast, and then the scar wire is actually right there as well. So it gives us all the information that we need when we get to a CT scan that might be a little bit harder to tell. Um, we had a patient right before I got here. It 
unfortunately I didn't get to get the images, but she was so large that you couldn't tell once we got to the CT scan where her breast tissue ended and her arm fold started, which made it really difficult. So we hadn't put those wires on, it would have been really helpful. So those are the kinds of things that now we've learned we need to go back and try and remember to do that on some of those bigger patients. So our contouring guidelines that we use, our GTV, CTV is the seroma cavity plus clips. Our surgeons are really good about putting clips in. Again, we wire the scar too just to make sure that we're in the right location. The PTV for the boost varies a little bit between our physicians um, depending on, as I said, the uh, cavity that we're looking at, the margins that they got. For 3D plans, we usually do a black edge at one centimeter. The electron boost plans one and a half. Sometimes we go up to as much as a total of one and a half, a two centimeter block edge margin. It's physician preference. And the other thing that we make that decision based on is the size of the woman's breast. If she has a larger cavity and a smaller breast, we try and reduce the margin a little bit if she had good margins on the surgery, just because we don't really want to treat the whole breast as a boost. So for our whole breast contour, we do a contour based on the tangent field coverage. We often include the pectoralis, sometimes the rib and chest wall. If the patient has a cavity close to the chest wall, I'll talk about this in a minute. It's something that we haven't quite figured out a definitive answer as to how we'll contour this. So I wanted to just go over, I'm not sure if any of you are doing the newer RTOG 1005 protocol, but I think it's interesting to note the contours that they do. The whole breast volume that they draw, the CTV is based on the wired breast tissue. So you saw that on the patient before, she was one of our protocol patients. We had a wire all the way around the breast. It's limited five millimeters from skin and anterior to the pectoralis muscle. It excludes the lung and the heart. And then they expand that for a PTV and then ultimately uh, contract it a little bit for the PTV eval, which is the CTV plus seven millimeters, excluding the heart, taking five millimeters from skin and anterior to the ribs and lungs. So it sounds confusing, but it's really not that bad. Um, this is kind of the, this is the volume that you'll end up with. You can see that the actual PTV is this smaller line that's harder to see outside that ends up outside the breast that's why we take it in off the skin and we don't want it in the lungs so that's what it ends up looking like for the lumpectomy volume uh, the GTV is a seroma and clips the CTV is a GTV plus one centimeter excluding the pectoralis and taking five millimeters from the skin and then the PTE valve is another seven millimeter expansion excluding the pectoralis lung and taken also from the skin so as I said here, with it, this ends up being a one, almost a 1.7 expansion. It ends up being a pretty big volume. Um, the coverage that they end up wanting in this, you can actually, a 90% covered by 90% is acceptable in this plan. So when you take that into account, you could actually be blocking almost to that volume and still achieve that. So however you want to achieve that, but these are the volumes that they're using. So that's kind of what we've based ours on. So just a little tip um, how to contour the whole breast. You could sit and contour it slice by slice, but we find with the number of breasts we do and the amount of time that takes, it's not something we really want to be doing on a daily basis. So what we do, we put the tangent fields on and we run a quick plan. And you can just use pretty much any selected isodose line to determine what kind of coverage you want. You don't need to worry when you're doing this about any of the hot spots. It doesn't matter if there's 110. We're really just looking for the isodose line that's covering what we want to cover in the breast tissue. So you can use your planning system to create a contour from this isodose line. We then create a skin contour, you might call it external, subtract five millimeters for the buildup region. Some people I know use three millimeters because RTOG is using five, that's what we've started using. Um, when I wrote this presentation about a month ago, when I put this together, we were expanding our ipsilateral lung by about five millimeters as kind of a trick to take the contour off of the chest wall and the pectoralis muscle, usually about a five millimeter expansion pretty much covers that. We don't always do that now, and our physicians are kind of going back and forth. Um, as I'm sure you guys know, with the prone treatments, you're really not covering the chest wall. So the question is, how often do we need to do it, especially in these early stage patients? So that's something that I think is still a little bit under review that people will be hopefully figuring out more about in the future. Um, you'll limit your original 90% isodose line contour by your skin. So basically, just take it in off the skin. And if you want to take it in off of the muscle and the rib, you can do that. So there are a lot of different ways to use your contouring tools, your Boolean operators, to make that happen and make it a little bit easier for you. You'll be left with a general um, breast PTV contour. You'll need to alter this a little bit because obviously you don't need it going as far into the arm if you're using IMRT as you might um, with just a standard and tangent field. But it definitely gives you something to start with and a good place to begin. So this is just kind of an example. 
of what I was talking about here. You can see we have the orange contour is our PTV. We've taken it five millimeters off skin, and this one we didn't take off the muscle or the chest wall because you can see that we have a large GTV and it's pretty close to the chest wall. So we wanted to make sure that we had that covered. Um, I'll go into boost volumes a little bit later and what we do with that in our clinic. So we'll get there. Um, the standard tangent field, I'm sure everybody in here has done this quite a few times. Um, some places, some of our physicians like to put them on. Sometimes we put the fields on and then they check them. But as we heard in a few talks this morning, make sure that your physician's going over these volumes. If you have a resident do it, if you're helping with it, make sure that you look at it. And even if they put it on, make sure the flash is there and make sure you're covering what you need to cover. And make sure when you copy and oppose the field that you're still covering what you want to cover because sometimes you'll end up with less flash. Um, the way we do it, as I said, we're using a pinnacle system. We create the medial field angle. We copy and oppose it for the lateral. We, set, we try and set the ISO midway between the soup and inferior field borders. We try to allow about one centimeter to two centimeters of lung, depending on the patient and any um, of the physician's recommendations based on what they know about the patient. We put the calc point usually around the ISO center anterior to the ribs and chest wall. We don't like to be calculating the dose in the lung or in bone if possible. You might need to move it depending on the shape and size of the cavity. If you have a really superior um, cavity, seroma cavity, it's going to be hard to get dose if you put it in the middle of the field. So obviously, you can move that around. It's not a hard and set rule. We collimate the field to maximize the breast coverage and minimize the lung dose. You can see here. Um, we have the same amount of lung at the top and bottom of the field, but we have the breast, might be a little bit hard to see in the back, but the breast is pretty much centered in the field that we have. And we allow about one to one and a half to two centimeters of flash just to ensure that if the patient moves a little bit on a daily basis, if their breathing changes, that we're covering the entire breast in the field. One of the things that um, sometimes happens, even with one and a half to two centimeters of flash, a patient will, the breast will swell during treatment and you'll end up having to add more. So it's just an unfortunate part of the process and we just end up replanning those patients. So a few things to pay attention to. Your 3D reconstruction can be really helpful. Um, take a look at it, see where your breast is sitting, look where your field's falling on the skin. Um, watch the arm position. Sometimes the arm can be in the way. If a patient has a hard time getting their arm up, it might be in the way, and you need to determine if you really want to treat through the arm. The physician might want to, but make sure that you bring that up to them because on, a, on the axial slices, it's a little bit harder to see that that's what's happening. Um, you can kitch, kick the couch if it's necessary. Usually, if you're doing a two ISO plan for a four field, we'll kick the couch anyway to match the superclav. But for a tangent plan, you don't, need, don't be afraid. You can kick the couch there, too, uh, if you think it would help you get off fold or get off the arm or even if the chin is low and the patient couldn't turn their head, keep your exit dose away from the chin. Um, we also, as I mentioned, get worried about the inframammary fold, the dose to the inframammary fold. So we often consider using an inferior block for breasts hanging low onto the abdomen. Um, it prevents a lot of disquamation, helps these women get through their treatment a little bit better, especially if we know that's where the boost volume is going to be. We really don't want the hot spots there from the beginning. I'll show you that um, what that looks like in a slide in a few minutes. Um, but really, use your 3D image. Do we need to contour other organs? That's up to you. Um, if you have a really low-hanging breast, you might be getting near the liver. It's a physician's call. I don't think it happens very often. Also, be careful of your contralateral breast overlap. That's also something that will probably be more of a problem if you're treating IM nodes. But look at it on skin because the last thing you want is on the field oak day when the therapist put on that light field and it overlaps. They call in the physician who doesn't realize that that had happened in the first place and now you have to replan because they've put on too deep of an isocenter or an angle that crosses the other breast. So just be aware of these things up front because it'll save you a lot of time in the uh, later on. So these are our general optimization goals. I'll get to our definitive DVH criteria in just a minute, but we try and keep have no hot spot in our breast over 110%, minimal large areas of 105%, proper GTV, CTV, and PTV coverage, minimize the lung dose, reduce the hot spot in any skin fold. As I said, our physicians really don't like anything above a 105 in the skin fold. And we try to keep it to no more than 50 to 20, 15 to 20% overall contribution of 18 MV from either the medial or tan lateral tangent field. 
So our guidelines are pretty simple. You remember 95 and 95, and you'll pretty much cover everything that you want to cover. Um, our whole breast PTV, CTV, um, and our whole breast PTV, our tumor bed, CTV, and PTV need to be covered by 95 and 95. Again, this is kind of a clinical decision. Some of our physicians would like better coverage than this. When you think of a whole breast PTV, a lot of time when you're using just a tangent uh, contour, you get a little bit more of a PTV than you might normally think needs to be treated or is breast tissue. So keep all that in mind. As I said, the RTOG criteria is a little bit looser than that. An acceptable plan, 90% can cover by 90%. So really it depends uh, what your physicians are looking for and on the patient. Our general clinical practice for the tangent fields is ipsilateral lung B20 less than 15%, although 20% is acceptable. But keep in mind that this is tangents only, so that really shouldn't be hard to achieve. The constraint is going to be a lot higher for your four field plans because you bring in that super cloud field, which is going through the lung if you're using um, an AP and an AP or an PA field or um, oblique, slightly oblique fields. Our heart dose, V30, less than 5%. The mean heart dose is less than 3 gray. We've pretty much taken this from the RTOG as well. But um, our physicians really try to reduce the heart dose. We'll even put in a special block for the heart if we can avoid, if it's not close to lumpectomy cavity, just to ensure that we're not getting extra dose, especially with the younger patients. We really try to limit the heart dose as much as possible. So how do we achieve this? We are working with the Varian IX and Trilogy machines. We have six and 18 MV photon beams. I'm very jealous of the people with the 10s and the 15s that we mentioned earlier because that would be really useful for these hybrid plans. But um, our electron beams, we have 6, 9, 12, 16, and 20 MEV. We try not to use our 20 MEV for our breast patients because some of our physicians have seen some reactions. They're not very comfortable with it. Multi-leaf collimators, we have half CM and one CM leaves. We have dynamic wedges. We have hard wedges. We don't use them unless the therapists have been really mean to us that week. Then uh, we force them to put them in the machine. But no, we actually, we really don't use them at all. I think we've used them once since we got our new machine in three years. We have Pinnacle. We use forward planning and control points, dynamic wedges, and DMPO. I know a lot of people are using Eclipse and Rapid Arc, but we aren't using these currently for our breast planning. So now I'm going to go through a few different ways of doing the breast planning uh, with control points, wedges, hybrid, and um, a combination of control points and wedges. So you've probably done enough breast plans to know that you could pretty much do it any of these ways and make any of them look good. It's really just a matter of getting used to what works best for you. For our forward planning control points, we start with a 3D plan and our 6 MV beams. We copy the medial and lateral fields, make them 18 uh, if we feel that the hotspot's high enough to warrant 18s. One of our physicians started using 18s on pretty much every plan that we do because she's seen some more severe reactions in some of our younger patients and she is trying to avoid that for them. She's also seen them a, f a couple of patients a few years out that you can still see uh, radiation, kind of the radiation fields that we've treated, and she wants to try and avoid that a little bit unless, obviously, there was some sort of reason to have more skin, if there was skin involvement. We turn on the hotspots for control points, and you basically add your control points that way. So you can see on this field here, I've turned on the 108% hotspot in a dose cloud. I've turned on my calc point. You just want to make sure when you're doing control points that you don't cover up your calc point because you don't want to cover where you're calculating with the uh, MLC field. So I left the MLCs open. They're probably a little bit difficult to see, but I wanted you to see the cloud that I was covering. And also the red outline is our lumpectomy cavity. So you just want to make sure that you're looking at the big picture when you, when you um, turn on these and create your control points because you can put too much weight on your control points and take away from your plan. So you can start wherever you want. If your plan's really hot, you might start with 110 because there's too much 105, 108 to do with your first control point. We try and limit our, our control points to three or four per field. We heard the other day um, in one of the talks about how many, the actual number of control points versus a step and shoot, but this is just in the control point, when you look on Pinnacle, it tells you the number, and that's what I'm going to go by here. So you black out the 108%, give it weight. Um, we've given the 108, this first control point, 10% weighting. You can do it any way you want. You can start doing the medial and the lateral, blocking out your 108. You could start with doing just the medial, add some weight to that, then change your lateral based on that. Whatever works best for you. Um, I think we, I usually do both the medial and the lateral field the first time, and then the next control point here, I turned on the 105, looked at that, and added some weight that way. 
So again, whatever you're more comfortable with, but just make sure that every time you add weight to a control point, you're going back, you're looking through the axial images of your plan and making sure that you're still covering what you want to cover, especially that GTV, because you can see here that we're covering a lot of the area near the GTV. This one, um, the plan was a little bit hotter because the cow point was deeper because the seroma cavity was a deep cavity that was also a little bit lateral. So just make sure that you're checking as you go, because if you get to the end and now your 100% is breaking up, you go back to the beginning, so it's kind of, kind of worthless. These are axial slices for this patient. You can see it was a really big cavity that was sort of deep. We were near the heart. Um, it was a younger patient that we were trying to stay off the heart pretty much completely. Um, you can see here the red is the 100%, the green is the 105. You're going to get a little bit of a hot spot here because our calc point is right here. So you're not going to be, because it's just simple tangent fields, you can't block out part of it. You're going in from that angle. So that plan, so that's what the control point plan looked like. Your next option is just to use wedges. So again, you can start with 3D plan, use sixes, use 18s if you feel like you need to. Um, we, with our machines, the Dynamic wedges only can only come in from one direction. We're limited also by our wedge angles. I know with elective machines you can use whatever angle you want, but we have commissioned dynamic wedge angles. So we have to rotate our collimator to make sure that the wedge is going in from the proper direction. They can only move in the Y direction. Rotate your collimator to accommodate the wedge and adjust them accordingly. We have um, 10, 15, uh, 25, 30, 45, 60 degree wedges. So. Sometimes you kind of wish you had a 35 or a 40 degree wedge or maybe a 50 or a 55. You could even copy the field and do some weight on a 30, some weight on a 45, kind of create your own 40 or 45 degree wedge if you don't have that ability. Um, but again, make it work the way that you would like it. This is what this plan looked like. Um, pretty good uh, wedge distribution plan. You see there's still a little bit of 105 here. The problem um, with adding a higher wedge angle, we were stuck here with kind of that problem. We had a 30 degree wedge on with a 45. We started to lose coverage here and we're getting pretty big hot spots down here. So we stayed with the 30 degree angle on this one. And you can also see down here at the bottom of the field, kind of near the fold, we did have a 105. So that would be uh, one of our, our physician would have a problem uh, with a plan like this with that hot spot at the bottom. So then option three, to get rid of, you have a pretty good wedge plan. It's covering what you want to cover, but it's a little bit hot. You can mix wedges and control points. So if you're using six and 18s, it's pretty simple. You've already have both fields on there. Keep your sixes or your 18s, whichever you prefer, your wedge fields. Then turn your collimator to bring the leaves in, in the direction that you want for your control points and put control points on those fields. So it can be... It can definitely be helpful for some plans. It's sometimes a little bit unnecessary. For our treatment machine, we try to avoid it if we can, just because it takes a little bit of time to rotate the collimator. And while you know, 30, 60 seconds doesn't seem that much for our therapists when we add that every day for these patients, it, with we have a lot of um, breast plans on our schedule, it adds up. So it's something that we try to avoid if we can. That's why we um, try and stick with wedges or control points. So this is what the plan looks like. It's a pretty good plan. Um, you don't really see any of the green 105 hotspot. It's covering the PTV pretty well. And we, like I said, we've gotten rid of the hotspots down here. This is just what the prescription looked like. We had um, the left mead is our 6 MV field with the wedge, 34%. We have 15% on the left mead 2 and the left lat 2, which are our 18 MV fields with our control points. But again, you can do it however you find works best. You could obviously put on a higher wedge. It would cover a little bit better. You could renormalize, use that instead of using the wedges. So that takes me to this. So plan optimization. There are, you know, the old saying, there are a lot of ways to skin a cat. So if you need better coverage of that very superior, inferior, deep tumor volumes, you can move the calc point. That's obviously going to make your plan a little bit hotter. You could also renormalize your plan. Um, if you need deeper chest wall coverage, you can renormalize. You could also move your isocenter deeper for that us um, when that also is going to obviously add more heart, more lung, depending on which side of the breast, which breast that you're treating. So keep that in mind if you start moving your isocenter. Um, if you want less lung, but you need to cover a deep medial lesion, which means your isocenter has to be deeper, you can keep your deep isocenter, but you can add in a lung block for the rest of the field that's not near the PTV. So this is what one of our physicians will do not infrequently, just to try and limit the lung where she doesn't think that, um, away from the PTV that we don't need to be treated. Or you can try hybrid IMRT. 
So the general concept of hybrid IMRT is that you're using the same tangential fields, you're keeping some of them open as a 3D plan, and you're keeping the other part, you're allowing the optimization system that you're using to optimize the other tangent fields. So you're still keeping tangent fields, but it's creating the control points rather than you creating them yourself. So these are the guidelines that we have currently created for when to try a hybrid IMRT plan. When your whole breast V105, so the volume getting 105% of the dose, is greater than 75 cc's, when your whole breast D-max is greater than 108%, when you can't cover, obviously, the 95 by 95, or if you think that you can decrease your hotspot volumes by 20%. So if your V105 is 100 cc's, you think a hybrid plan could get you down to 80, then you might be willing to try it. The problem with this I'm going to get to is 75 cc's. What does that really mean? In a person with a really small breast, 75 cc's is going to be a lot more hot spot than in a person with a really large breast. So we're trying to kind of figure out a better way. Maybe we need to go by the percent of breast getting 105% rather than a definitive number of cc's. So I'll go through a little bit of data that we found so far. Um, we're working on trying to come up with a solution to that right now. So when might you be more likely to need hybrid IMRT? Patients who might fall into this area often, but not always, have large breasts that might sit unevenly on the chest wall or non-uniformly shaped breasts, women with large tangential separation, women with convex chest walls or uneven chest wall and breast thickness, or patients with deep lumpectomy cavities where you can renormalize all day, you can move your calc point all day, but it just gets the plan so hot that you really can't cool it off enough with the control points. So for hybrid IMRT, as I mentioned, you create two prescriptions, your tangent 3D and your tangent IMRT. You copy your tangent fields for four total beams. You have your medial and lateral 3D, your medial and lateral IMRT. You can assign them to the proper prescription. So just be careful when you do this. If you're rushing through, you might end up with your IMRT fields that you want to keep that you want to optimize on your 3D prescription. And it does matter because as I get to next, you have to determine, determine what percent of the prescription you want to be IMRT and adjust your dose accordingly. So originally when we started doing this, we were doing 20% IMRT, 80% 3D standard open tangent fields. We found that in some of our larger ladies and in just certain cases for whatever reason, we need more IMRT than that. So a lot of times we'll run the plan a few different ways with a different percentage of IMRT. And there's not a definitive way of knowing what you need to do. We don't. We allow whatever percentage of IMRT you feel is appropriate for that plan. So if you want 60% IMRT, you'll need to associate your prescriptions accordingly. So you'll separate it for 60% of the centigrade that you're going to. If you're doing 180, it'll do 72 and 108. If you're doing 20% IMRT, you just take 20% of the total dose, set your prescription that way. So this is what it ends up looking like. Uh, this is a pinnacle printout for those of you that are familiar with it. You'll have your medial and lateral fields, which are your 3D, your medial and lateral IMRT fields, and you have two prescriptions. You have your 3D tangent prescription. This one we have 60 centigrade per fraction for the 3D open 3D field, which are um, our 18 MV fields. Then for our IMRT, which are um, our 6 MV fields, we've given 120%. So this one was about 33% uh, versus 66%. You can see here, too, I don't know if anyone's even paying attention this closely at this point, but um, the IMRT fields are a little bit larger than our open tangent fields, so I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, that was on purpose, though. The hybrid IMRT, when we optimize them, this is the way, again, that we optimize in Pinnacle. It's going to be a little bit different with the fluence maps that you're using in Eclipse. But you keep both prescriptions on. You want the IMRT optimization to see the 3D dose. So we're creating these open tangent fields that we know are hot with the 3D. We put the fields on. We determined we needed hybrid IMRT because you have these 105, 110 hotspots. So when you're optimizing the IMRT, you want it to see the dose from the 3D so that it helps even that out. So in the IMRT optimization, you'll set the 3D fields to none because you don't want them to be optimized. You don't want the jaws to move. You don't want them to split. You don't want it to put in control points. You want those to be your open fields. Set your maximum number of segments. About 10 to 16 total segments should be plenty. I'll show you why in a minute. When you do too many, it actually can overmodulate your plan. And you create your optimi optimization objectives. So this is an example that we have. Um, you, we've got our GTV, our PTV. I'm sure everyone has their own way of optimizing their IMRT plans. That's fine. Uh, but this is a flash contour, which I'll get to and explain in just a minute. 
our lung, our tissue, and then this one was a larger lady. We have an inframammary fold that we've contoured on there, so we want to limit our dose there. You can put the weighting however you want. We often start with just a simple weighting of one on everything, see how it looks, and then determine what we need to cover based on that. So some frequently asked questions when we're planning these, this is kind of what we go through with our students when we're trying to help them. Can you still use different, different energies? As I just showed you, yes, absolutely. So we do not allow at my clinic IMRT for 18 MV beams because of the neutron contamination, which was mentioned earlier today. Um, so we make sure that we optimize only the six MV beams. Can you still use a wedge? Certainly on your 3D open fields. If you want to use a wedge, if you feel that it's necessary, go ahead. We don't think that it's ever really necessary. We haven't found a case where we thought it helped us out at all because the IMRT really takes care of the coverage, but feel free to. Do the IMRT and 3D fields have to be the same size? No, we have found actually that for whatever reason, when we're optimizing, we get a little bit less hotspot when we allow the field to open up a bit. We allow this to happen as long as we're still meeting our lung and heart constraints. Um, but again, that's up to you if you want to keep them the same. And so what about flash? So if we think about it with a standard 3D plan, the open fields is usually about 80% of the total weight of the fields that you're treating. We have flash to account for any change in positioning, breathing movement, or setup error. So if you're doing a hybrid IMRT plan where you're only doing 20% IMRT and the rest of it's open field, then you might not need flash. But if you start to get to a plan where you're using 60% IMRT and only 40% open, our physicians feel very strongly that we do need to put flash on those patients. So we're actually trying to figure out a way to do that because it is a pain in the butt to get to the end of your plan and have to pull every leave to open them up on your IMRT because it's automatically going to move the jaws or move the leaves in around your breast because that's all the things it needs to treat. So actually one of our physicists, um, I'm not sure if anybody from Washington University in St. Louis is here. If you are, thank you for this tip because he brought it to us from there. Um, We've created a flash structure, and it's kind of a dummy structure that in Pinnacle we create a ring contour outside of our breast volume. We expand the breast by two and a half centimeters because we've already brought it in half centimeter off the skin, so this gives us a two centimeter expansion outside of the skin that we're looking for for our two centimeter flash. We limit that contour by the skin and external contour, so this creates a ring, and I'll show you that in a minute. I showed it on very, one of my very first slides, but I'll show you again. So you look at this contour in the 3D view, you might need to uh, shave the edges if they extend outside the field. But in your IMRT objectives, when we optimize the plan, we give this structure a minimum dose of 300 centigrade. I've had a couple of people ask me before, do you give this, do you do a density override? No, we don't. We don't want it to see this as bolus. We don't want it to see it as a tissue. We're just telling Pinnacle, by giving it a really low dose of 300 centigrade for the entire 45 grade great plan. Pinnacle just sees it as a structure that it should take into account. We give it the lowest weighting possible, um, much lower than any of our other objectives, and it's not actually pushing dose there, it's just opening it up around that structure rather than just opening it up, rather than pushing the leaves to the breast volume. Um, so the important thing to remember though as you're doing this is always review your segments after because you might have some that are only open for that and you really don't need that. And I'll show you that in just a minute too. So this is just how we create our flash. Um, this is the plan that I showed you earlier. We have a PTV here. We've created a flash structure outside of our um, breast PTV here so that we just have a way for it to see that we need to have the field open there. So as I said, when you do the two and a half centimeter expansion of your PTV, keep in mind that's a volumetric expansion, so it's going to expand in all directions. So you can see it goes a little bit behind the field that you have open and above and below. So you could either only expand it by two and a half not, and just don't do it in the soup and info direction, or you can just go through once you're done and cut out these slices above, edit it a little bit. So once you run your plan, you'll end up with a 3D plan that looks like this. This blue structure is the flash structure, so that's two and a half centimeters outside of your breast, um, and then you'll end up with your IMRT field, you see that it's opened it to the flash. So while it's not pushing dose there, and you don't have any hot spots, you don't need to worry about that, it does open the field, so we're left with a little bit more flash, which makes our physicians more comfortable on a daily basis. So when we first started doing our hybrid IMRT, when we run our IMRT plans, we usually allow about 10 segments per field just on any given IMRT plan that we do which we started doing with our hybrid IMRT plans, but what we quickly found out was that this was over-modulating some of these fields. If you think about it, we do a breast with forward planning control points, we use three or four control points. So why do we really need 10 when we're doing it this way? And the answer is we don't. Um, 
what we found is you look at a field like this, it's a little bit hard to see because it's not zoomed in, um, but we don't have, the only thing open here is flash. The breast is completely covered. It's just trying to give a little bit of dose there because it saw it as a constraint. It had extra control points to work with, so it opens up that field. So what you can do for fields like that is just delete them, recalculate it, and you'll end up with pretty much the same plan. Um, also, by allowing 10, um, obviously this is going to change depending on the size of the field that you allow with your IMRT optimization parameters, but you end up with really small openings and that's really unnecessary too. So we found that you really don't need more than 10 to 16 total control points for both of the fields on your plan. Again, something you can work with, mess around with, try and see what works best for you. On some patients you might need more, some you might need less, but always review your segments once you've run the plan to make sure that you're actually getting all the segments look the way you want them to look. So imaging, this is something that we have discussed a lot, and again, we are still working on how we need to be doing this. Our 3D plans, standard tangent fields, we, KV, we use KV films on our field localization day. We do weekly MV fields to check the actual field size. We do not do daily imaging on our 3D plans. Our hybrid IMRT, we do KV daily, we do weekly MVs, we KV first and then MV. But we're trying to determine if we're doing control point plans anyway, then why don't we, if, if we have the control points, we're only doing weekly MVs on them, should we be doing daily KVs on them? Or are the daily KVs on this hybrid IMRT necessary because we do have our 3D open field? So that's a project that we're working on right now and hopefully we'll have that information later. So what we do at our clinic, hybrid IMRT can be a better option, but it's not always optimal. It's also not always improve, approved, as I said, by insurance for treatment, especially on right side of breast. We often run two plans for any patient we think might benefit from IMRT. Uh, there's not really a definitive criteria for a better plan. I'm going to show you some data in just a few minutes, but it's really hard to look at a number and decide if a plan looks better than another plan. I'm sure you guys know you could look at a DVH that looks great, but when you go back and look through the plan, the physician might not like it at all. So we're trying to figure out the best way to determine, if there is a good way to determine that. So now I'm just going to quickly take you through a few wedge versus 3D control points versus IMRT plans just so you can kind of look at the difference and then look, what the, look at the plan on an axial, a couple axial slices and then look at it on a table and show you how this isn't necessarily indicative. So we have our wedge plan, our initial, and an IMRT. I'm just going to run through these quickly so you can just see what it would look like. Remember, this is one axial slice. It's not going to show you the whole story of the plan. These are sagittal and coronal slices. I've got our PTV on and our GTV on all of these. So this is what our DVH looks like. Um, you can see that the biggest thing that probably stands out here is our lung dose. The IMRT lung dose is higher. That's because we've allowed the field to open up a little bit. Our lung dose was still within our B20 that the physicians allow, so we have to determine, are we going to try and push lung harder on these patients? Do we push for better coverage? When you look at the information in tabular form, the number of control points is obviously a lot more with IMRT. Then what we decided to look at was the volume of breast that is getting 105% of the dose. And when you look at this, the wedge plan has a lot more 105, 417 cc's versus 200 versus 168 in the 3D. When you look at, at that as a percent of volume of breast receiving 105, the 3D um, forward plan, control point plan was a little bit better. The wedge had the most 105, which we saw based on those hotspots that were at the bottom of the field. When you go to look at the GTV and PTV coverage, you can see that the 100% coverage is definitely a lot better in the IMRT. When you get to the PTV and the GTV 95% coverage, we've got GTV covered by 100. The IMRT is covered a little bit better than the 3D. So again, we can look at this plan, say that your mean dose on the heart is higher for our IMRT, your lung dose is higher, um, you might have more 105%, but we are covering the PTV a little bit better. So how do we determine what is a better plan? And that's where we end up making a clinical decision. So unfortunately, I don't have an answer to you on that. This I just threw in here to show you on that last plan. Um, this is what our one of our inferior inframammary full blocks will look like. So this is what it looks like when we do it um, with wedges because we need the MLCs coming in this direction for our wedge to come in on the Y direction. When we optimize it with IMRT, because we did put in that optimization parameter for the inframammary fold, it's going to bring in a block there too. So just remember when you're doing control points, if you put in a lung block, a heart block, an inframammary fold block on your first control point, keep that the whole way because the purpose of having it on your technically open field was to have it there the whole time, so make sure it stays there. 
This is the second plan, same thing, just going to show you. Uh, we have 3D, the control points versus hybrid versus wedge. I put down here the hotspots so that you can see that the hotspots actually a little bit higher in your hybrid plan here, sagittal and coronal. Again, DVH looks pretty similar. The long dose is higher. That's because we've allowed the field to open up, but we're well within our limits, our DVH constraints for the lung. And again, uh, this plan, we see a little bit higher, a greater percentage of volume getting 105, but we're within all the current strains that we met. When you go to look at the PTV coverage, you can see here that when we look for the 95 and 95, our 3D plan is only covering by 93%. So again, it becomes a clinical decision. Is the PTV exactly how the physician wanted to draw it? It's again one of those cases where you might get to the end of this plan, tell her it's not covering quite enough, you think hybrid's better, and your physician says, oh, well, maybe I didn't quite draw the PTV the way I wanted. Maybe if I edit that a little bit, it covers what I want. Great, thank you. That's not quite what I wanted to hear after I've run three plans for you. So that's why it's really important to come up with a way to do this in the beginning and try and do that every way. Make sure your physician's looking at these. I know it's a pain to draw breast PTV contours, but if you're going to be optimizing an IMRT plan, it does the optimization and it needs to know what it's optimizing. It doesn't have you to think about it and make the decision for the physician for you. So the final plan, I'm just going to quickly run through this. I'm running out of time here. Um, this one, we didn't allow the movement at the lung as much, so you can see we now our IMRT is very similar to our 3D plans. I actually have um, the lung dose down here too, but in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through all these numbers They're there if you want to look at them later. This one, our hybrid IMRT was actually far and away a better plan. She was a bigger lady with the location of the tumor volume. Our coverage is a lot better than 95. Um, we have almost 99% coverage on the PTV. We have 100% on the GTV, um, but a lot less 105 and higher hotspots. So again, how do you look at these numbers and determine if a plan's better. And the answer is really that you can't. You need to look through it. You need to see where those hotspots are, especially in a breast plan. It really makes a difference where the hotspots are. Is the hotspot near the nibble where they might have a reaction? Is the hotspot in the GTV that you're going to boost anyway so the physician's comfortable with that? So keep all those things in mind when you're looking at these plans. These are the numbers we've taken. Um, we had originally done this without, wedge, without a wedge plan to compare, just a 3D forward control point plan versus IMRT. So this will be in here if you want to go back and look later. If you guys haven't had enough talks on things for these few days and want to go home after your long week and look at that. But uh, um, GTV, PTV coverage. I didn't put the long volume in here because all of them were meeting all of our lung constraints. And Basically, we just need to determine what do we want an IMRT to optimize to. Are we more concerned about better coverage on a PTV? Are we more concerned about the hotspots? When we optimize our IMRT, what we've been doing is telling it to not have a hotspot over 105, but we're not telling it to limit the volume of 105, so maybe we need to start doing that. So we need to come up with a better way to determine how we want to do IMRT and how to determine whether a plan is better or not. Can we really just look at a volume and determine that it's better? So our boost volumes, just quickly, we just a note, we re-CT all of our boost volumes that are over 30 cc's. We actually did a study at our clinic a few years ago where we looked at lumpectomy, lumpectomy cavity volumes. We re-CT'd our patients um, partway through treatment and found that most lumpectomy cavities, over 80% of them do change volume, especially the large ones. They change by an average of 32%. So if you think about that, that's a really big change in the amount of volume that you'll be treating on these patients for the boost. This is what it looks like. This is some information, some pictures that we had in the paper. Um, this is what the plan would have looked like if we had original, used the original volume. This is what it looks like with the reduced volume. This is what it looks like on skin. You can see it's a big difference. So keep that in mind as you're treating your patients. It, we've definitely found it to be beneficial to rescan our boost patients. We do it around 30 to 34 gray and find that it really does make a big difference. So in conclusion, um, even simple breast tangent plans can be tricky due to patient size, anatomy, location of their lumpectomy cavity. There are a lot of different ways that you can do this, and you can and should try them, get used to them, get familiar with them. When our students come through, we make them do them, the plans all different ways just so that they can get used to it. I know I was moving between clinics when I first started, and everyone that I worked with did it a little bit differently, and they all came up with really good plans. So find what you're comfortable with, what you think works the best, and that's what you know, but just make sure you've tried the other options. You can also develop scripts and protocols to make the IMRT optimization fast and easier. Um, Pinnacle's really good with the scripts that they have and the ability to create them for your optimization parameters. You can have these plans running really quickly, especially with the ring contours, that with the ring contour option that they have. 
And as I stressed in my talk yesterday, don't be afraid to try something new. We, as I said, are really trying to compare the 3D versus wedge versus hybrid IMRT, and I think there's a lot of room to improve, especially you know, as we worry with these insurance plans and whether hybrid IMRT can be approved or not, we need to make sure that we still have good options for these patients. So I'll take any questions. That's a great question that I meant to add in and I forgot to. We QA all of our IMRT plans, yes. Um, that's why we, so I think I might have skipped over it. It's on one of my slides. We don't film our IMRT fields uh, ever during treatment. We film all of our 3D fields. But we don't film our IMRT fields because we do run Monte Carlo on every one of our patients. Actually, when we first started doing these plans, we were doing a film verification on the machine for all of our patients just to make sure because of the hybrid plans, we wanted to make sure we were getting what we thought we were getting. But now we've moved to Monte Carlo for all of our um, IMRT plans.